So now we'll talk about um, how to represent numbers in a computer. So we've talked so far saying that um, we have ways of recording bits in a computer. We could set bits to either 0 or 1. And what we'd like to do is um, be able to assign integers. And then uh, maybe the integers can have negative values or positive values. <coughs> and then we'd also like to look at floating point numbers, where you have a decimal. And um, the only thing we have to work with are bits. So, um, so an example of an unsigned integer, that means the numbers are 0 and positive. Take on those values. For example, if we have four, four bits put together, sometimes referred to as a nibble, so zero would be represented as zero, 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 zero. You get four bits. One like this, two. So it's just basic counting through decimal numbers. And we could go as high as 15. So with four bits, we can represent unsigned numbers, no negative numbers. We could represent zero through 15 with four bits. If we wanted to do signed magnitude, what we could do is, I mean, if you're going to take a, if you're going to pick a bit and let the bit decide whether the number is negative or not negative, um, which bit would you pick? The leftmost one. Yeah, it seems like the one that's I don't know used the least. It's only used when the numbers get very large. So we'll let the leftmost bit, if it's a one, we'll let it be a negative number. And if it's a zero, we'll let it be a non-negative number. And I'm saying non-negative to include zero. Like the zero is not positive or negative. So. so in this case, it would be a sign. The first bit would be the sign. And then the remaining bits would be the magnitude, how, how big the negative number is. So again, we can now, with 15 bits, since we've decided we want to represent negative numbers too, we're going to use up almost half of our numbers on negative numbers. So instead of going from 0 to 15, we're only going from 0 to 7 now. And then we have a way of representing negative 0, which is also 0, and then negative 1, negative 2, and so on. So one thing is, you know, we have two ways of representing 0. We have like positive 0 and negative 0. And we don't really need two representations for it. Um, a different way of doing this, and this might just seem a little bit odd at first, is using a method called the ones complement system. So the ones complement system, the positive numbers stay the same, zero stays zero, but at this point what we're going to do if we want to represent a negative seven, we actually complement all the bits. So instead of it being negative, um, Instead of it being negative, negative 1, 1, 1 to do a signed magnitude version of negative 7, we flip all the bits over. Okay. Does this seem odd? You know, I mean, it's, it's a set of rules will follow, but does it seem like any point to doing this? So in other words, all we really did was reverse the last column. So, uh, you know, this being, uh, so instead of this going negative 0 to 7, it's negative 7 down to 0. So all we're doing is we're saying this bit will be a 1, uh, a one meaning negative, and then the magnitude, which is 1, 1, 1 for a 7, we flip all the bits over. 1, 1, 0 would be a 6, so we have all the bits flipped over. So the magnitude bits are all flipped over. They're all complement, the opposite of that. Okay, so it's an easy thing to remember. You might say, why bother? Why bother flipping the bits over? Just leave the bits alone, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, another method <coughs> which eliminates the idea, and there's actually there's a, there's a good point to doing this, but another method is to use the one to represent negative, flip all the bits over, and then add one to the number. So what we can now do, instead of representing numbers from zero to negative seven, actually, so we had a negative zero, 
negative zero and positive zero. So instead of representing the numbers from zero to seven, we can now represent the numbers from negative one to negative eight. We get in one extra number, the negative eight gets added. Okay, so you might think this is like, you know, this is the headache. Why not just stick with the easy thing, just sine magnitude. Let this be the sign, and this be the value of how far away you are from zero. But there's a huge advantage to using this twos complement, and that would be when we talked about um, creating a ripple adder. Remember we, we talked about having two inputs plus a carry produces an output, what it adds up to, and then the carry to the next one. If we represent negative numbers using the twos complement system, we can now add a negative number to a positive number and get a correct result using a ripple adder. So I kind of put this picture together to kind of represent that. So these are all our numbers, right? Our numbers are, I don't know, inside this wheel, zero. Then our positive numbers are in green, so they go around to seven. And then we can represent negative eight coming all the way around to um, negative one. And whenever you add two numbers together through a ripple adder, you, it's kind of like you're just going around this wheel. So for example, if we were to take the number 3, 0, 0, 1, 1, and add a 3 to it, it would be kind of like going around this wheel, three notches. So you would go from 0, 0, 1, 1, it would come around to 0, 1, 1, 0, if you put that through a ripple adder. If we decided to add uh, let's skip this one, that's the one that doesn't work. If we wanted to take a number like negative 3 and add it, and add a 5 to it, so if you took the number negative 3, which is now in our 2's complement representation, will be negative, then you take 3, flip all the bits over, and then add 1 to it, and you actually get this number. So if we took negative 3, um, and added 5 to it, if you took this number and the number 5, 1, 0, 1, 0, and added it, it would move it along the circle, going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and it would end up at positive 2. So if you took this, 1, 1, 0, 1, and 5, 0, 1, 0, 1, added them together into a ripple adder, it would come up with this result. So if you use this method of representing a negative 3 as 1, 1, 0, 1, that's the 2's complement version of it, looks you know, very strange on the eyes, but if you run it through a ripple adder, negative 3 plus, two, plus 5 will equal positive 2. And it works with two negative numbers. You could take a negative number, I'm sorry, you could, yeah, you could take a negative number, add a positive number, and even if the result is a smaller negative number, it still works. So if you took 1, 0, 1, 0, which is the two's complement representation for negative six, and you added two to it, you would get the two's complement version of negative four. The only time the subtraction doesn't work is when you cross the positive to negative boundary. So for example, if we started with seven, which is our biggest number, and we added two to it, we would actually end up with a result that equals uh, our representation for negative seven. So 7 plus, positive 7 plus 2 will end up giving us negative 7, and then we have to throw an exception because we know that's not a correct result. So that's the only one that's marked in red. So the purpose for using this two's complement, even though it's a little bit confusing way of representing negative numbers, you, you turn the high bit on to mean negative, you take the magnitude, you flip all the bits over, and then you add one extra to it actually makes the, the math work perfectly even. So now, in a sneaky way, we could do subtraction because if we wanted to say, well, what is 5 minus 3? We have an adder, but we don't have a subtractor. But what we could do is we could take 3, rewrite it into its, uh, you know, just complement all the bits, and then add 1 to it. Now we have negative 3, and then we can add negative 3 to 5. So we can actually with our adder and the complementer, we can do subtraction. Okay, so yeah, so this was just as we were going around the wheel, I just wanted to go through each of the examples. So for example, if we wanted to do the number three and then add three more to it, 
3 plus 3 ended up being 6. If we wanted to take negative 3, which in 2's complement, so a 3 would be a, would be a 0, 1, 1. So we flip all the bits over, we get a 1, 0, 0, then add 1 to that and put a negative sign on it. So negative 3 plus 5, the 1 and the 1 add up to 0, the 0 and the 0, uh, 1 and 1 add up to 0 with a carry of 1. We have 1 here. This plus this equals 0, carry the 1. The carry plus 1 plus 0 is 0, carry another 1. And we end up with 2. And I put this in a different color, we could just ignore that. So the result would come out 2. So this, this equation right here represents this part of the wheel. We took negative 3 and added 5 and ended up with positive 2. So adding this number to 5. So this is binary, if this was just positive numbers, this would be 8 or this would be 13 plus 5 gives 18. But 18, if you ignore the higher bit, becomes 2. So the math would work fine in that case. So this one, we, add, we could add these two together through a ripple adder and just ignore that and we still get the correct result. Negative 3 plus 5 equals 2. And then if we had negative 6 and we added 2 to it, so the, we just want to see if we end up with a negative result, is it still valid? And the answer is yes. We could take negative 6, so this is negative, 6 is 1, 1, 0, flip all the bits over 0, 0, 1 add 1 to it, so that's negative 6. And this is positive 2. So if we add negative 6 to positive, you know, a 2's complement negative 6 to a uh, positive 2, 0 plus 0 is 0, 1 plus 1 is 0, carry the 1, 1 plus 0 plus 0 is 1, 1 plus 0 is 1. So we end up with a uh, binary representation for 12 which is, according to our wheel, 12 is uh, negative 4. The binary representation for 12 is 2's complements version of negative 4. And then again, the only one that doesn't work, I would kind of highlight it in red, is when we cross the positive to negative boundary. So the biggest number we can uh, add you know, we have, this is the biggest number we can represent. If we try to make it more positive, we're just going to end up with a really large negative number. And then we'd have to throw an exception. I don't know if you've ever run a program and then it says, you know, exception uh, value calculated is too large. Some kind of an error like that. So that would be, you'd hit one, you'd hit one of these um, situations. Okay, so yeah, so that's integer values. So what uh, Java uses and most C++ compiler use, use for uh, integers and shorts and, um, you know, integer values is the two's complement representation. It makes the processor's math components easy to use. And then when it converts to display, you know, it's going to display it back to a digital, a, a decimal number, and it's going to put the negative sign in front of it. So the software to convert it back is no problem. Okay, so then if we wanted to represent um, floating point numbers, um, so for example, a, flo a floating point number is a number that has, you know, an integer component, then a decimal, and then a fractional part. Okay, so suppose we had a number like 12.34, 1, 2, 3, 4 with a decimal point right there, in decimal numbers. Well, we could think of that as 1 times 10, right? So this would be, this would be 1 times 10, 2 times 10 to the 1, which is 1, 3 times 1 tenth, right? And 4 times 1 one hundredth. That's just another way of thinking it, and then summing it all up. So this is the way we want to we want to get to understand this because we have to use bits to represent um, the number. So we could look at it several ways. We could think of it as 12.34 times one. You could slide the decimal point over one, and then multiply it by one to the ten. 
right? So here I'm dividing it by 10, and here I'm multiplying it by 10, same number. Could also write it as 1, 2, 3, 4 times 10 to the minus 2. Or 1,234 times 1, 100, which is like divided by 10. So does it make sense? Because this is kind of important because we're going to use this trick to represent numbers. But does it make sense that these three are all saying the same thing? They're all just different ways of saying the same thing. So, uh, so for example, have you ever put a very large number into Excel? I just typed in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and just kept typing it over and over, and then hit enter, and it represents it looking something like this. Have you ever seen a number represented this way? So what it's doing is, I typed in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you know, a very, very large number, and it turned into 1.2345. I actually had 6, 7, 8, 9, and I rounded it off to 7. So my 6, 7, 8, 9 got rounded off to a 7. And then it's saying the exponent is positive 18. So since we're human beings, we use decimal. That means times 10 to the plus 18. So what Excel is doing, if you've seen this before, is it's basically saying if you typed in 1, 2.34, they might turn it into 1.234 with an exponent of 1. Just another way of writing it. Okay? So yeah, so it's important to understand this, because what we're going to do, because we only have bits, we're going to record this piece, and we're going to record this piece. But we're not going to use base 10, we're going to use base 2. So that's how uh, we'll represent floating point numbers. So what we're going to do is, um, floating point numbers can be represented as uh, of the form, sometimes they call this a mantissa, and then times a base and then an exponent. So in decimal, for example, 12.34, 12.34 could be rewritten as 1.234 times 10 to the 1. So if we know the base is 10, we don't have to keep writing 10. We could just remember this piece and this piece. We'll just record those two pieces and capture the number that way. So now in binary, if you wanted to represent a number like 6 and a half, but you only have bits, you can only record bits, what we could do is 6 and a half, well, how do you write a 6 in binary, positive 6 in binary? That would be 1, 1, 0, right? And how would you represent a half? How would you represent a half if you only have bits? Well, if we had 1, 1, 0, which is right there, and then let's say there was a decimal point here, the next bit would be, right, so the, so the, the next bit after the decimal would be like times a half, and then times a quarter, and then times an eighth, and so on. So if we wanted to represent 6.5 in the decimal number, it might be 110. If we were allowed to use decimals, but we're not on a computer, but let's pretend we are. If we wanted to represent 6.5, it would be 6110 point. Now every decimal after that is the next bit is a half, the next one's a quarter, the next one's an eighth, and we turn them on and off and have it add up to whatever the fraction is. So really the way to to represent it would be like 110.1 one, one, one. would represent 0 0.5, I'm sorry, 6.5. Our base is going to be 2, so we want to record the fact that the exponent is 2. Okay, so I just put a little note here. Sometimes this is called the mantis of this part, sometimes it's called the significant, and sometimes it's called the coefficient. So, I don't know if you remember that from like high school math. You remember this having a name? Remember what it was called? Or? What? Okay, so it's one, it's one of, depending on who your, the author of your textbook was, it would have been one of these words, significant, coefficient, or mantis. Okay. So for example, um, Let's just change it just a little bit. Let's just say the number we're representing is 6 and 1 quarter, 6.25. So this would be how you would represent 6 in binary. So 
this number times 1 plus this number times 2 plus this number times 4 and so on. The next one times 8 times 16, you add it all up. So it'd be, so you could kind of read this as 4 plus 2 plus 0 is 6. The next one is this number times a half and this number times a quarter and the next one times an 8 and a 16. So whatever you want to represent, just turn the bits on and off to represent the one you want. So to represent 6.25, if we were allowed to use a decimal point, but there are no decimal points in our, in our computer registers, but if we were allowed to, we could represent it as 110.01. That's 6 and a quarter, 6.25. And it's spelled out, it would be 1, plus, one times 4 plus 1 times 2 plus 0 times 0 plus 0 times a half plus 1 times a quarter, and then we'd be done. So we could represent it like this, and then this way, like Excel does, where the decimal point comes all the way over here, we could represent it as 1.000, I'm sorry, 1.1001 times the base to the 2, which made us move the decimal point two places. So, Six and a quarter could be, in binary, could be represented like this or like this, whatever your favorite flavor is, and it means six and a quarter in decimal. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to record this piece, and we assume since we're using a computer, everything is base two, and we're going to record this number. We're going to record this and this. So what do we need to record? For six and a quarter in decimal, suppose we had a lot of room. This is the part that represents six and a quarter. And then the decimal is just how many point, how many decimal points do we have to move it over until we have a leading one. So like Excel wrote the number with, they have one digit, then a decimal point, and then a bunch of digits, and then they tell you what the exponent is. So we're gonna do the same thing. <laughs> okay, so we just need to record 11011. The zeros on each side we don't really need, and then if we can just record something that tells us where the decimal actually goes, we're going to always put the decimal here, and then just tell us how many times we have to move it to get the correct value. And we have to record the fact that there's two, um, we have to record two in decimal in the exponent to know that. So basically, what we're really going to record is these five bits, no decimal point. The, it's going to be implied there's a decimal here, so we're going to have to know to multiply it by 2 to get the correct value. So IEEE came along and decided um, decided they're going to save one bit that's actually not necessary. So, in de yeah, let me go back to this slide. In, dec in decimals, if the, what do we call this thing, the mantis? If this thing, if we put 1.234, we have to put the decimal right after the first digit that's not a zero, right? Because there's, there's actually implied a bunch of zeros after here. So the first thing that's not a zero, we would put the decimal here. So we'd go 1.234 times 10 to the some exponent, right? The decimal would go right here, right? Right after the first digit that's not a zero. Right, so, so if this is what we're trying to represent, right? Zero, 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 one, two, point, three, four, zero, 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 zero. The only part we care about is, is you know, we can chop off the zeros on both sides. And then we're gonna put our decimal point right in front, right after the first non-zero digit. So if we did the same thing in binary, if we took six and a half and said, we're only going to remember this part, that's the only significant part worth remembering, and move the decimal point over right after the first non-zero symbol, um, the argument was we don't need to, see, in decimal numbers, 
this first non, non-zero number could be one, two, three, anything from one to nine. So we have to record it. But in binary, what is the only symbol that's not zero? One. One. So we don't even need to record it. So this is the part I think that's the most confusing. So they're basically saying, instead of, rec- instead of remembering one, one, zero, zero, one, right? We want to record this, and we want to record the number two. They're basically saying, since we know the decimal is going to, it starts with a one point something, why even bother recording the one? We know it starts, we know that the uh, significant or the mantis or whatever you call it in binary, we know its first digit is a one. In decimal, it could have been anything. It just happened to be a one in this case. But in binary, it's definitely a one. So what might be intuitive is to remember this piece and an exponent of two. But then they argue, you know for sure the first digit is a one. So you don't even have to remember. So uh, binary, non-zero, one. Binary, the only non-zero is one. And so we know that the leftmost digit is a one. So I triple E figures, why bother recording it? So what we're going to end up recording, so we're going to, we're going to record two th- uh, three things. We're going to record the sign, 0 or 1, the exponent, and then the mantissa. But we're going to get rid of the leading one to give us a little bit more precision, a little bit better, you know, closer to the true value of the number. So uh, IEEE format says if you have 16 bits, you use uh, 5 for the exponent and 10 for the mantissa. If you have, and, you know, one for the sign. It's always one for the sign. 32 bits, you use 8 plus 23. And for 64 bits, you use 11 for the exponent and 52 for the mantis. Okay. So, for example, um, I hope this doesn't come out too dark. Um, if you wanted to represent 6 and a quarter, we need to record... Negative six and a quarter. Sorry about that. Well, so this should be negative six and a quarter. So negative one. The number is negative. And now the thing is that so so here's the thing. We want to remember one one zero zero one. But I triple E says we know this is a one. So why bother recording it? So we just take these four, put those down, and then have the rest zero. So it could have been bigger. But this is all that was worth remembering. And then we have to record the um, exponent. Now our exponent is 2. So why do we have a 17 here? So they want to allow exponents to be negative or positive. And the rule of thumb is to pick the halfway point of these five bits. So the halfway point is 15. So we'll always put whatever number is here, we're going to subtract 15 from so if you want the exponent to be positive 2, you have to put in a 17, and we'll subtract 15, and that'll give us positive 2. So if we had like all zeros here, it would be like having an exponent of negative 15. And if we had all 1s here, which would represent 31 minus 15, would be positive 16. So it's a pretty confusing <laughs> way that they represent the numbers. So just a, a little bit of a recap. Um, the first bit is the sign positive or negative. Uh, the mantissa is, it represents the part, the part of the number that when you strip away the zeros on each side, the part that's left over, we record that. But we notice that the first number will definitely be a one, so we don't bother recording it. So we record everything after the first one. And then the exponent there's a certain number of bits for the exponent. Whatever the halfway point, so with one, two, three, four, with five bits, we could represent zero through 31 in value. But sometimes the exponent is positive and sometimes the exponent is negative. What you might think is why didn't they represent one bit to mean positive and then the rest be, you know, like a kind of a two's complement version. Why not have positive and negative exponents that way? And um, I don't know if there was, there's any advantage to doing it this way. But the way we represent positive and negative exponents 
is we say whatever the halfway point is, so the halfway point would be 15, the halfway value is 15. Whatever number you put in here, subtract 15 and that'll give you a real number. So if you put in a zero, subtract 15, it's like a negative 15 exponent. So if we want an exponent of two, we had to put 17 in here. 17 minus 15 is positive two. So again, the, the way you'd read this is negative exponent of two, and the mantissa is one, one, zero, zero, one. That's the, that's the way you read that. So that's a little, I know it's a little confusing. But now it makes the math easier because you can now multiply numbers together by multiplying exponents and mantissa as two separate operations. So we could take this part, multiply that by another number, and so on. Okay, yeah, so this is, uh, so this is just out of curiosity what Java does. So Java uses the IEEE format. Um, bytes are in Java. Two's complement sign numbers. Shorts are 16-bit two's complement sign numbers. Integers are 32-bit two's complement sign numbers. And longs are 64 bits. And then if you've ever used float or double in Java, it's using the IEEE format, the format we just went over. The 32-bit version and the 64-bit version. So I just went over the 16-bit version, because that is also follows IEEE's format, and it's easier to see. Picture, so. Okay. So now when you declare storage in C++ or you know Java, if you declare something as an integer, you're getting 32 bits. And if you put the number in negative, um, the processor will convert your number into the twos complement version of it and store that number. Same thing for longs. And then uh, the way we just described the floats would be handled the same way. And mostly the point of this, the point of two's complement is to make the ALU, the part that does the mathematics, makes that go easier to do. And the same thing, it'll also make the mathematics on floating point numbers go quicker if you represent it this way. Okay, is there any, any question on number representation in memory? Okay. 